Chapter 3, Measures Essential Tendency, Part 4, The Mode. The mode is a score or category that has the greatest frequency of any score in the frequency distribution. It can be used with any scale of measurement, so we can apply the mode to the nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio scales of measurement. However, it's not always going to be the most informative, and the reason being is that it may have multiple values. There may be um, several scores with the highest frequency. And given the fact that the function of the main function of measures of central tendency is to identify one value that best represents all, <clears throat> excuse me, all the scores in the distribution, the mode, again, may be a flawed um, value to illustrate central tendency um, simply because of the fact that there may be multiple modes. It corresponds to an actual score in the data. So I have shown you examples of calculating the mathematical center for the mean. And I pointed out that um, in some cases, in a lot of cases, it may not actually be one of the x values in our distributions. Similarly, when we're working with um, um, finding the median, it may, given an odd number of scores, it may be an exact x value in our distribution. But when we have an even number of scores, it's the average of the two center scores, which may not be one of the x values. Additionally, if we're working with a con finding the continuous variable, um, excuse me, the median of a continuous variable, again, the x value may not be one of the values in our distribution. But the mode will always be an x value from our distribution. So keep that in mind. The mode is the measure of central tendency that will always be reflected in the original data set that we're working with. And finally, again, as I mentioned, it is possible to have more than one mode, which makes the mode the least effective in terms of reporting um, measure of central tendency. So here's an example we refer to as bimodal. Technically, if it's bimodal, we have two x values that have the highest frequency. So this um, research is looking at tone identification scores, so the ability of someone to recognize tone or pitch um, of a sound. And we have frequency on the ordinate or x values on the abscissa. And so if we were asked to report the mode, um, first, what we need to do is look for the highest peak, right? Because the mode is defined by the value that has the highest frequency. So this value here, right, um, has a frequency of 8. And um, some students will have the tendency to write mode is equal to 8. And that would be incorrect because 8 represents the frequency. What we report for the mode is the x value. So the mode would be reported as 2. 2, not 8. 8 tells us how to find the mode. 8 is the highest frequency. And then we report the actual x value. Again, our, our abscissa represents our x value. So don't make the mistake. It's very common. It's even more common when the distribution is nominal, when we have named categories. And students um, want to report the frequency versus the x value, which represents the named category. Let me just show you what I mean by that. If I'm looking at um, majors represented in this class, so we have SOCH and um, Psych, let's see, Criminal Justice and Nursing. All right, just to name a few, and let's say I have a frequency of eight sociology majors and I have 25 psych majors and five criminal justice and five nursing. If I were to ask you to report the mode of this distribution, again, the data, the scale of measurement um, that represents this data is nominal. They're named categories that cannot be ranked and therefore um, we, we can't define this as ordinal interval or ratio. Interval and ratio require numeric values for an x variable. So we know it's nominal, and if I wanted to report the mode, again, many students would want to write 25 as their response because that's the highest number. But again, that represents frequency, so that would be incorrect. So the mode would actually be psych, that we have the highest representation of psych majors, um, and they represent that category, that x value is the mode. So just keep that in mind. 
um, when you're given a distribution of nominal data. All right, going back to this particular example, the mode was equal to 2, but we also recognize that this value over here has quite a high mode as well. And I might have uh, written them a little bit um, crooked, but um, we recognize that this ha also has a very high frequency as well. So we want to, uh, we don't want to ignore that because it is significant. If we have um, more than one value that's showing high frequency, we don't want to ignore it. So for this particular distribution, um, one may actually include that value, x value of 10 in addition to 2. And even though they don't have the same frequency, they're both high enough where we would want to um, convey that information. And in most cases, we would refer to this as the major mode because it has the highest frequency of 8. And this would represent the minor mode. Still significant, but slightly less popular or um, frequently occurring than the score of 2. So this score of 2 and score of 10 would be significant and worth reporting. Um, and we wouldn't want to ignore that other x value of 10 that had quite a high frequency as well. So again, this is a demonstration we refer to as bimodal. In some cases, bimodal represents a distribution where two values have the exact um, frequency in the highest frequency. But that's not always the case, as in, as in this example. We have a major mode and a minor mode. So this table gives us a good sense of when to use um, which measure of central tendency. And so the last lecture video, I did go into detail about when you would opt to use the median opposed to the mean. The mean is most um, understood and um, most readily utilized in um, in classrooms, outside of classrooms, we're very accustomed to understanding what the mean represents, and so it's often the preferred measure of central tendency, but there are instances where it's not the best. So it is appropriate to use if you can calculate the sum of x. If you know what every x value is equal to, then um, and you can do the computation, then the mean is appropriate. It's also appropriate if you know the value of every score. Um, so again, in order to calculate the sum of x, you need to know what every score is equal to. It could be misleading, however, if we have extreme scores, as in the case of the price of housing, the example I gave in the last lecture. If we have extreme scores um, and the distribution is significantly skewed, then the mean will be affected and be a misrepresentation of the other scores in the distribution. So extreme scores are going to skew the distribution and, I, and also if we have undetermined values, open-ended distributions, or if we're working with ordinal or nominal data, the mean is not appropriate. Um, in fact, if it's ordinal or nominal data, we can't even compute the sum of x. So the sum of x is not even possible um, because nominal data are word categories. I can't take the word sociology major and psych major and nursing major and add those words together. It's impossible. However, in some research, um, we may code these, these words. Um, so we may, given purposes of entering data, give sociology major code of 1 and psych a code of 2. And again, that's just a label um, with a numeric value, so it would be inappropriate to use those numbers to take the summation of x. Um, so just keep that in mind. Also with ordinal scales, even if you have the ranking of um, those who finished a race, so the first, second, third place winners, it'd be inappropriate to take that, that named category of first place, second place, third place, and sum them up and divide by how many um, individuals were in the race. It's not an appropriate application of calculating the mean. So again, if we have ordinal or nominal scale of measurement, then the mean is not appropriate. And I talked about examples of when the distribution is considered um, as including undetermined or open-ended x values. 
The median um, is the more appropriate measure of central tendency when we have extreme scores, um, when the distribution is skewed, when we have undetermined values, meaning that we're prohibited from summing x, open-ended values in our x distribution, and when we have ordinal data. So if we have ordinal data, we can rank the named categories, so first place, second place, third place, so on and so forth, and once we rank them, we can find the center value of that distribution. So again, these are the reasons when we would use the median opposed to the mean. And it would be misleading and inappropriate to use if we have nominal scale of measurement. So again, objectively, I cannot say that social majors are better than psych majors, and psych majors are better than criminal justice majors. I couldn't rank them um, objectively. Subjectively, I may have a preference for one major versus the other, but it's not appropriate when we're engaging in scientific research. So if the distribution uh, includes a, no a nominal scale of measurement, then the ordinal, you can't rank it. Ranking is the first step of finding the median, so we're prohibited from applying the median when we have an ordinal, um, excuse me, um, nominal scale of measurement. And then finally, the mode. Um, most appropriate when we have nominal scales of measurement, again, named categories, we're just going to report the most popular category. When we have discrete variables, um, so it's appropriate to use when we have discrete variables, but if we have discrete variables that are numeric um, and we can take the sum of x, then the mean would be preferred, unless, however, the distribution is skewed. And um, appropriate to choose if we're describing the shape of the distribution. So again, given the location of the mode, it will help us understand where, what kind of distribution we're looking at skewed, symmetrical, positively, negatively skewed. And it could be applied to all the scales and measures, interval or ratio data, except to accompany the mean or the median. So it could be misleading um, if we're just reporting the mode and we neglect the application of the mean and the median. So again, it's the least effective, in other words, when we are using quantitative data. So if we have interval or ratio scale of measurement, the mean and the median are going to be preferred. The mode could be applied, but it may not be as effective given the fact that it can have multiple um, values, as in the case of a major and minor mode. So keep that in mind. But if the distribution is strictly nominal, the mode is the only value that we can use as a measure of central tendency. We're going to move into the shape of a distribution. So central tendency in the shape of the distribution. Symmetrical distributions, the mean and median have the same value. And um, if exactly one mode, it has the same values as the mean and the median. The distribution may have more than one mode or no modes at all. So let's just talk about the symmetrical distributions. What we mean by symmetrical is Again, in the center, we have um, split the distribution in half. And if it's symmetrical, the mean, median, and mode will all be in the center here. They will all equal one another. So the mean will equal the median, and the median will equal the mode. So they would all be the same value. By definition, the mean um, splits a distribution in half where we have equal distance above and below. And if we had actual x values, we could um, affirm that. The median says that 50% of the scores are above and 50% of the frequency, it can also be thought in those terms, is above and 50% is below. And the mode is defined by the highest frequency, the highest peak of the distribution. We could have symmetrical distributions that are bimodal, and um, so again, it may look like right where we have two modes, but it is symmetrical. If we split it in half, we have um, equality on, on both sides, um, so just take that into consideration. When we are talking about this idea that the mean, median, and the mode are all equal to one another, that applies to a distribution that only has one mode. Okay, so symmetrical distribution, mean, median, and mode are all equal. 
Now, something to think about. If we have a symmetrical distribution, which measure of central tendency would you report? And the answer would actually be the mean. And I know that there that's kind of a funny a concept to put your mind around, but since they're all equal, but if a distribution is um, symmetrical, then we would prefer just to report the mean as the best measure of central tendency because it's the most understood. Um, but if it is symmetrical, we recognize that the median and the mode are exactly identical to that x value for the mean that's being reported. So here are some other illustrations. Again, as I just uh, indicated, uh, when the distribution is symmetrical and only has one mode, all of those values are equal to one another. Here in the second example, we do have a symmetrical distribution um, and the mean and median are in the center of that distribution, but we have two peaks, right? So it, this is considered bimodal. We have two modes. Um, and those two modes do not equal, in terms of their x value, are not going to be the same as the mean and the median. And this last example is symmetrical as well, but it has no modes. And what we mean by that is, so again, it is symmetrical. We have the mean and median in the center splitting the distribution in half. And we would say it has no modes simply because all these x values down here, all these x values have the equal equal frequency. So n none of them have the highest frequency. So we have um, this the same number of x values that we have would also be the same number of modes. So that's sometimes referred to as um, n modes, meaning that the sample size is equal to the number of modes. And in this case, we would see that it's very ineffective in terms of the purpose of reporting measure of central tendency. The purpose of measure of central tendency is to identify one value that is the best representation of all of the scores in the distribution. If we're talking about a distribution that has no modes or um, n modes, we have as many modes as we do x values then what that means is that we would recreate the whole distribution. Um, we would say the mode is equal to, and we would list all our x values, which you can see would be really ineffective in terms of the purpose of the measure of central tendency. So again, n modes referring to we have as many modes as we do x values and is um, not appropriate when we're trying to summarize a data set by using one x value. When we're working with a skewed distribution, the location of the mean, mean, and mode um, can be understood in terms of um, it, it, if it's greater or less than the mean or um, excuse me, the median or the mode. So here's an illustration of a the first one is positively skewed distribution, and this is negatively skewed distribution. We don't have any numeric values, but what we're being told is the position of the mean in relation to the median and the mode. And this will always be the case that um, mathematically speaking, the mean, if a distribution is positively skewed, the mean will be greater, numerically speaking, greater than the median, and the median will be greater numerically speaking, than the mode, right? So this is our x distribution. This is zero here. The values increase as we move to the right. So this value that represents the mean is a larger value than the median in the mode. So again, um, the mean is larger than the median, and the mean is larger than the mode. And if that's the case, if you're given values of the mean, mean, and mode, you can determine if the distribution is positively or negatively skewed without having the visual um, interpretation. Also, by definition, positively skewed, again, this is frequency, means that we're going to have the high, highest peak, right, represent the lowest x value, because again, this is zero to the left. And so if it's positively skewed, the values are going to be piled closer to zero or closer to a lower x value in comparison to the median and the mean. Now if it's neg negatively skewed, 
then the reverse is correct. The mean will be less than the median. Again, we're talking numerically speaking what the x value represents, and the median will be less than the mode. The mode will be the highest x value. So again, if we recognize this as zero, values increase. As we move to the right, this x value is going to be less than this one, and that one's going to be less than the mode. Um, technically speaking, if you just do the comparison between the mean and median, you will um, be able to assess if a distribution is positively or negatively skewed. The mode kind of throws it off because uh, we may have instances of a distribution with multi-modes, um, so keep that in mind. Another thing that you can think about in terms of um, trying to assess or understand, and this is more for visual students, if you envision yourself walking up this peak um, and you're facing the ordinate, right? you're facing the ordinate and you're walking along um, this incline, the first thing that you're going to encounter is the mean followed by the median and the mode. And um, interestingly and, and conveniently, it'll always be alphabetical. So the mean, median, and mode. Those are the values that you would encounter. And as a result, we would recognize that the mean is the highest value and the mode would be the lowest value. And when you're facing the ordinate, you can think of um, social interaction. It's always positive social interaction to face the person you're speaking to versus turning your back to them. So again, if you're facing the ordinate, you're alphabetically speaking, you're going to encounter the mean first, then the median, and then the mode. And if you encounter the mean first as you're walking along, you know that that's the furthest from zero, therefore it's the highest value. If it's negatively skewed, again, you're walking up this, this hill, and uh, now you have your back to the ordinate. Again, think of social interaction. We you turn your back to someone that you're speaking to, that's a negative social interaction, so it's going to reflect a negative um, distribution, negatively skewed distribution. Alphabetically speaking, again, we're going to encounter the mean first, then the median, and the mode. And since we started on the tail here that's closer to zero, that means, numerically speaking, the mean's going to be less than the median, the median's going to be less than the mode. Hopefully these are different ways in which you can um, understand um, the relationship between the numeric values that represent these three different measures of central tendency and how you can use those numeric values to assess whether or not the distribution is symmetrical, positively or negatively skewed. So a quick learning check to make sure we understood, um, we are understanding the, the relationship between these measures of central tendency. A distribution of scores shows the mean equal to 31 and the median equal to 43. So first of all, we would recognize that the distribution is probably, it's definitely not symmetrical, right? Because symmetrical means that the mean, median, mode are all equal to one another. And we see that the mean and the median are not equal to one another. So now we would take into consideration the x value of 31 that comes before 43. Again, that's not to scale, but nonetheless. So if the mean is less than the median, what does that mean in terms of the skew? And again, uh, this idea of open-ended, that's not applicable to what we're trying to uh, determine here. And we weren't told what the modes were, so we can't determine if it's bimodal. We don't have enough information to determine that. But what we can assess is whether it's negatively or positively skewed. So again, we plotted the x value of 31, which is the mean, and 43 is the median. The mean is less than the median. And again, there are a couple ways that we can determine that. We can go back to what I had indicated here, the mean is greater than the median, median is greater than the mode, positively skewed. If the mean is less than the median and the median is less than the mode, then we have a negatively skewed distribution. So we would determine that this is an illustration of a negatively skewed distribution because the mean is less than the median. Um, so again, we would just compare those two values and conclude that what we're looking at 
Just given these two data points, those two measures of central tendency, we can conclude that the distribution is negatively skewed. We don't need any other information. Uh, we don't need the x values. We don't need a visual. But we can create our own visual to um, make that determination. Okay, one more. If we decide if the, these statements are true or false. Um, the mean uses all the scores in the data, so the best measure of central tendency, so it is, excuse me, the best measure of central tendency for skewed data. Well, yes, it does use all the scores, which is essential and important for um, constructing or coming up with a one value that is representative of all the scores, but what did we learn about skewed distributions? We learned that the mean is not an appropriate measure of central tendency. Again, keep in, um, keep in mind the example of the how, price of houses in San Diego County. If we relied on the mean, we would um, compute a very large value that represents the price of homes in San Diego County. The median, where we line up all the price of homes in order from highest to or lowest to highest, and we find the center value, that's going to be a better representation of the central tendency of those scores. So this would be considered false because this, um, even though all scores are, are taken into consideration when computing the mean, if the distribution is skewed, the mean is not the most appropriate. The mean and the median have the same values. So we're saying the mean is equal to the median. So the distribution is probably symmetrical. And I would agree with that because, again, we said that if those scores, the mean and the median are in the center, then we're working with a symmetrical distribution. So here is an expansion of those responses. The first is false. The mean will no, will be moved toward the long tail in a skewed distribution or skewed data. So that may not be at all represented with the middle. So again, Whenever we have extreme scores, the mean is going to be adversely affected. It's going to be pulled towards those extreme scores, whether it's on the low end or on the high end. And therefore, it's going to result in a value that is not representative um, of the center or middle. And then the second one was we determined was true. When the mean and median are the same, the distribution has to be symmetrical. The balance um, balanced about the mean and this idea in terms of distance and then 50% of scores above and below. And finally, I'm going to end with some basics of um, demonstrating these measures of central tendency in graphs. Um, to begin with figure 3.7, this is simply illustrating that when you're constructing a frequency distribution graph and um, values are jumping, um, from one to the other, and there there aren't any frequencies demonstrated or um, within this range of values. That is is completely appropriate to include these what we refer to as breaks in the x distribution. So again, this is zero x um, equal to zero, and we put a break to then in, start at the first x value of our distribution was equal to ten, and then we see that. After the x value equal to 13, the next x value isn't um, doesn't appear until the value of 100. And so instead of writing 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, all the way to 100, which would extend this um, the abscissa um, extremely and unnecessarily, we include this break to then jump towards the um, next x value, which is completely appropriate. So I just want you to understand what these breaks um, indicate. It's the omitted data and omitted simply because there was no frequency um, relating to those particular x values. And then down here, figure 3.8 is um, showing how we would represent uh, the means or medians in a line graph. And here we're looking at a drug dosage on the abscissa and the mean food consumption. So on average, they measured um, how much food the patients consumed after having these different drug doses. Um, and so the dot represents those who um, were in the zero drug dosage consumed on average, let's say it's 20 pieces of, of food or um, however they're measuring 
the food um, that, they, that was consumed. For those who received drug dosage um, one, then we see the average was about 25. Those who were in drug dosage uh, condition two on average, so again, it's not one X value, it's the collection of that group, the collection of individuals in that particular condition. Um, they consumed on average 15 um, pieces of, of food or however, again, they're measuring food consumption and um, so on and so forth. And so again, we're recognizing that the X values are representations of the mean for this particular example. If this were a histogram, and hopefully this won't get too ugly, um, it would show demonstrate the same information but look like this. So in the center would be the mean, and these bars would extend beyond that. So same information is being conveyed, um, and the center or the height represents the mean of these different conditions of the independent variable. The independent variable is varying by the amount of drug dosage um, administered to each group of patients. And in the end, when it comes to inferential statistics, it is the comparison of these sample means that will become important. Do these means differ because the dosage is um, causing this, this change? There's a cause and effect relationship between the dosage and the amount of food being eaten, eaten um, based on these samples. Um, is that difference due to the effects of the dosage or is it due to chance? That's what we're going to be moving into when we talk about um, inferential statistics. At this point we're still in the realm of descriptive statistics and just summarizing data, but the purpose of this is to make comparison between groups. And then finally here we have um, median price of homes given different regions. And so in the Northeast, the median price of a home is, let's say, approximately 225, 225,000. And for the South, it's about, let's see here, estimate 175,000, the median. The Midwest looks like, um, well, actually, this one is looks more to be 150. This one is 150, 150,000. I got ahead of myself. Um, the Midwest, about 175,000 is the median. In the West, 200, no, not surprising there, 250,000 as the median home price. So again, we have a bar graph, um, something to recognize that these regions, the labels of these regions is a nominal, nominal data. Um, however, what we've collected is the median price of homes. Um, and we represent the height, right, the frequency that's denoting the, the median price for these different regions, and we can make a comparison between the different nominal categories that we've listed on the x-axis or abscissa. So this is just um, a brief introduction of how you may encounter this information um, being presented in a research study and um, in that you can understand as a summation of the data that's been collected to convey some story um, about different social phenomena. And that concludes the lecture videos for Chapter 3. Please be sure to watch the videos um, where I demonstrate how to complete homework um, problems to help you successfully complete the Apley assignments for this chapter.